I believe that everybody has a story, and I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with actor James Moses Black. You've seen James on TV and film. He was in Entourage, Dexter, Southland, Shameless, Sons of Anarchy, Criminal Minds, Grey's Anatomy. More recently, he was on the smash NBC show This Is Us, playing sort of a Yoda and counseling Sterling K. Brown's character, Randall. Currently, James is in a movie called Black and Blue in theaters. It's sort of a gritty cop drama in the vein of Training Day-ish with a few twists. And coming up in early 2020, he'll be on an Amazon series called Operation 8888. In this episode, we talk about where James grew up and what got him into acting. We talk about different parts of his journey to get to where he is now. Of course, we touch on some of his past projects, which are my favorites. Plus, we talk about a screenplay James wrote about the first integrated hotel casino in Las Vegas in 1955. That particular project is in a bit of pre-production, let's say. So cross your fingers that you'll get to see that soon. I know I am. And this is my conversation with actor James Moses Black. Welcome to Fascination Street, James Moses Black. How are you doing today? I'm good, man. How are you? I am doing wonderful. Thank you for asking. So, Yeah, absolutely. Everybody listening, uh, James is an actor who's been in everything that you have ever seen and, <laughs> and everything that you're watching now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he has done so many amazing things. There's no way we're going to get to all of them. But what we are going to do is we're going to ride this squishy train until we reach our destination. Reach your destination, baby. <laughs> That's right. I remember that one. Yeah, I bet you do. All right, James, tell me where you were born and raised, man. Where are you from? So I was born in Virginia, Portsmouth on the Naval Base, and uh, we moved to Rhode Island for a while, and, and then we I grew up a little bit in Philadelphia, and then uh, we eventually landed in Pittsburgh. I uh, graduated high school from South Hills High School, and then um, I took the long train to college. So I went to University of Minnesota and uh, transferred to another college, Central State University in Ohio, historically black college or black university. And uh, it I, I took me like six years to graduate. I didn't want to graduate. You know, I was like, I was enjoying college life, man. So uh, that experience for me was, uh, was pretty valuable in building, you know, uh, today's version of James Moses Black. And then uh, after that, I, I got into corporate America and then I left corporate America. And I went to school again at ACT in San Francisco, which is American Conservatory Theater for a while. And I kind of honed my skills when, and uh, for that time. And then I ended up in uh, Los Angeles. So that's the brief of the story. Well, that is brief, but uh, we're going to backtrack on some of that. Uh, so, first of all, shout out to your pops for being in the Navy. My wife was in the Navy for quite some time, so I have a special place in my heart for the Navy. So, thank you to your father. Absolutely, and to your wife. <laughs> Now, you said that you went to school, one of the schools, in Columbus, Ohio. Is that right? No, I went to school in uh, was called a t small town called Wilberforce, Ohio, Central State University, oh, outside okay. of Columbus. Gotcha, mm -hmm. gotcha. All right, my bad. Uh, I spent some time in Columbus. My wife used to work a little bit up there. You know, we lived here, but then she would work there, so I'd go up there and hang out with her for a while. Columbus is a nice town. Yeah, man. I used to live in Columbus for a while. I lived on High Street, which is was near. It went down to uh, Ohio State University. Uh, I used to live in the Short North, is what they called it. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I enjoy call it. Yep, the Short North. Yeah, very cool. I, I enjoy Columbus though. Me too. Uh, we've gone back a few times. Uh, you know, we still have uh, some friends who live up there. They live in Chillicothe, and then we always go to the the Chillicothe amphitheater has this big presentation called tecumseh which i'm sure you're aware of uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it's amazing so we i mean we make that we fly up there you know from down here in texas just to go see that drama it's so great 
Yeah, Chillicothe. Yeah, that was that's a familiar term. Yeah. yeah. So you you got into the corporate world and you worked for some pretty big folks. Like you worked for Target and Federated and um, you know a few others. Yeah, PepsiCo. What did you do for them? I mess around all the time. I don't know. I, I you know I was a manager of people basically with Federated. Uh, managed departments, and then uh, Target the same way. And then PepsiCo, I managed a, a little outfit called Hot Now, which was a, a Taco Bell subsidiary. It was a restaurant that was basically out of Michigan, sort of a family-owned restaurant that PepsiCo bought. And you, you could get your burgers and shake or fries in 30 seconds was their claim to fame. It was actually really good. Whoa. Man. Yeah, yeah. By the time you ordered it and the time you got to the one, it would only take you 30 seconds. So, you know, half the time it took like a minute, you know. So uh, it was pretty cool, though, man. It was great. It was great. good to work there. And then I went to work for Taco Bell for a minute. And what was the name of that? Hot and Now. Hot and Now. Yeah, Hot and Now. Are they still around? I don't know. I heard there's a couple stores in Jackson, Mich- Michigan, but I don't know if they're they're around to the extent that they were before. Huh. You know, growing up in South Texas my whole life, I'd never even heard of that, but that sounds amazing. Oh yeah, it was it was pretty good, man. I mean, the food was really good. So, at some point, you decided to leave all of that corporate nonsense, or maybe you did it while you were still working for the the corporate fools. But you started your own clothing line. Yeah, it was called Jimmy Wear, man. It was a uh, it was a take on Do you have your Jimmy on? Back in the eighties uh, and early nineties, Jimmy <laughs> referred to as a, it was referred to as a condom. So they said, you know, do you have a Jimmy on? Meaning, are you protecting yourself? So I took it a step further, and I. The Jimmy wear, I sort of labeled it as a consciousness choice about what you do and your clothing. Does your clothing reflect that? So I had active stuff. I had casual stuff. And then eventually I sold it for pennies and then got out of the clothing business. The clothing business is a tough business, man. It, you know, you have to be at arenas. You have to be at conventions all over the country to sell your product. So I was kind of like a one man, sometimes two man show. And uh, it was just a tough business. And you got to be flying all over the country. All over the country, All over the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Flying all over the place to get stuff done. You had to go to Vegas for the show in Vegas, then Atlanta, then there was a show in New York. And then, you know, they had to do the Dallas March show. So it was just, it was a lot, man. But it taught me a valuable lesson about independency. You know, how, how sometimes you just have to be an independent person to accomplish the things you want. You can't bring a bunch of people along with you. Uh, It's just like acting. You have to be sort of an independent soul uh, because there's not a lot of room for other people to bring along, you know? So that's, that's that's a valuable lesson. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Why, why'd you sell it? Um, Because I was tired of it. You know, I kept some remnants. (laughs) Yeah. I was tired of it, man. I, I, that was long hours and traveling and, you know, I, I, I lost the love for it. So, you know, they, you know, they say, if you love something, you'll do, you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Well, I started working and then I was like, this is a, this is not, this is not love right here. This is work. (laughs) 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 I love it. So at at one point in your career, which you you have worn several hats uh, professionally in your career, but at one time you were a touring stand-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did the stand-up gig for a while, man. I was uh, I was living in Minneapolis, and I did the uh, got last something they had in the Mall of America, where the Mall of America used to be like this biggest mall in the world. And I did uh, knuckleheads. That's what it was called, knuckleheads. And then I ended up doing some comedy on Def Jam before uh, in Pittsburgh and a little bit in Philly. And then I did just little private clubs, Andrew Ford's uh, Club in Columbus, Ohio, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, oh, so, nice. yeah, yeah. Stand up comedy was fun. Another tough business, but it, you know, it's fun once you, you know, get the hang of your own life. Do you still do it? Do you still do stand up? I do. I do it privately, man. When my friends are over, you know, they enjoy my jokes, you know, so that's, that's the most stand up I can, I, I can do, man. You know, it, it's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most stand up. Nice. Yeah. So eventually you transitioned into acting, but before we talk about that, I want to ask you, do you think that being a touring stand-up and, you know, doing those dates and writing that material and performing in those clubs, do you think that that helped you in any way with your acting career? Yeah, you know, acting is all about confidence and courage. 
you know, a lot of the time it's just about your own confidence. It's not, it's about recognition of, you know, your own life in a sense and running things through your life um, that are written. Stand up is that way. You know, you, you, you stand up is basically uh, self depreciating. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you talk about your life and scenarios and things that happen to you. Uh, and you got to have a bit of confidence to, you know, to trust that and give it to the audience and, and, you know, let them deal with it in laughter or, or no laughter. TV is primarily the same thing. You, you got you to gotta pretty much trust yourself and your performance. If you don't have that confidence, you may not even make it to the shoot. You know, you might get cut before you even get the job. So part of it is you have to have a tremendous amount of confidence and courage about yourself. And that helped me in acting. That makes sense. Yeah. So I think one of the first things that you did was maybe like a Best Buy commercial. Yeah, man. During a union strike, but we did, hadn't struck yet. But yeah, I did. That was my first job, man. I made a whole bunch of money off of that, by the way. And I don't know what any of it is today. But you made enough money on that commercial to pay for ACT, right? Yeah, absolutely. Paid for ACT. I got up there, had housing in San Francisco where, you know, housing, that housing market was just beginning to take off. So it was super expensive. Uh, but I shared it with like four cats, four dudes, man. So it was pretty funny. It's pretty four four Asian dudes, man. It was pretty funny that Dion Chang is one of my good friends now, but it was just this collision of culture in our house, you know. But it was fun, man. It was fun. San Francisco was fun. That sounds dope. I've been to San Francisco exactly one time and it was way colder than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> you probably went in July. I want to say it was March, but I was, you know, okay. I'd never been to California before and we were going to Napa and uh -huh. I only brought shorts and t-shirts because I was like, it's California. It's always 75, <laughs> 79 or whatever. I froze my ass off. Right, right. Yeah. California fool you like that, man. Especially San Francisco. I think it was a famous writer said uh, it was the, uh, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's <laughs> that tracks that makes a hundred percent sense as far as I'm concerned. Right. Right. Let's talk about when you finally did get into acting. I would imagine that like most actors, you started on smaller projects, maybe even background work. How did you get started? Uh, I, I, and not no, no, uh, no shade to background workers, but I, I never was a background worker. Um, oh, good. I, you know, this, this business is about relationships. You know, a lot of this is about relationships, you know, people that you might come across and have conversations with that can lead you to another person that will have conversations with. So that's how I got started. I was in uh, Minnesota and I had a conversation with someone who told me that they had a friend and that friend that was in LA. And then by that time, I, had, I was in the union because of the uh, Best Buy commercial. And I think I did one other commercial in, uh, in, in, in uh, Minneapolis. So I was well into SAG and after by that point. And then when I got out to L.A., um, I was introduced to this other person. And then I got an agent through them, a commercial agent. And then that was my first sort of voyage into, you know, acting in California. So uh, I didn't. I did. A, I did a famous commercial, man. That, that people still call me on today. It was this um, uh, Las Vegas commercial. It was a construction worker. Uh, it's on YouTube. If anybody out there wants to look it up, it's dancing construction worker. And it was. Uh, it was about being in Las Vegas, and I dove through a cement mixer, and ended up on stage with the Chippendale dancers. <laughs> <laughs> Which is. <laughs> <laughs> so I was doing their dance in my interpretation. It was it's hilarious, man. Uh, so yeah, I got that in California, and and then the rest was yeah. You're you're right. You, you do you know you do smaller roles, smaller parts, and and you know all of a sudden you, you start doing bigger parts. But that that transition took a while. You know, it, it, it's a serious curve into you know bigger parts. Uh, it took me a while. I think. I think my career started just moving more rapidly around 2012, and I got started in 2001. Gotcha. What gave you yeah. the courage or the confidence to pursue acting? Like, what made you think you could do it? I mean, you're just a dude from, you know, Virginia. Right, right. Uh, I think I think just the way I was raised, my, you know, my mother is a, she was an artist back in the day, uh, and Bella Reese was her cousin. So I, there was a lineage in our family of entertainment. Wow. Yeah, I just didn't know I was I was part of it. You know, I was I thought I was going to be part of the uh, the dirt players. You know, the kids are just playing dirt all the time and just like, OK, well, what's next? 
So I, I was part of that, you know, artistic background. My cousin, Antoine Fuqua, uh, the film director. So we have some lineage of performance, performance arts in our family line. Holy shit. Yeah. Those are some big hitters. Yeah, I have a cousin. Uh, her name is, her band's name is Jack Lucy. She's really good. She'll she'll be here sooner or later, man. But she's really good. She's she performs around the country too. And her father was my cousin back in the day, and he he had a like a five member band, you know, and, and dance and all that other stuff. So we had that sort of lineage of talent that uh, which gave me confidence, you know. Plus, I was always a funny kid, man. You know, I was just like, you know, I was funny. You know, I'm just I was just a funny kid. By the time I got to California, I was a funny adult. So I said, I better take advantage of this, you know. Man, you, your family has talent coming out of its ears. Hey, Streetwalkers. Here's a word from our sponsors. Guess what, Streetwalkers? The gear is here. A bunch of you have been asking for quite some time, and now finally it's here. Head over to FascinationStreetPod.com and check out the gear tab. There... You'll find all kinds of FSP items to tickle your fancy. T-shirts, coffee mugs, sticker packs, pins, buttons, coasters, and my personal favorite, for just five bucks you can get one of those weird little phone handle pop thingies. So head to FascinationStreetPod.com and show the world that you're proud to be a streetwalker. Special thanks to my good buddy Stephen O'Reilly from the Bar Star Podcast for these dope drum beats. Check out Steve's work at O'Reilly Drums on Instagram or search Stephen O'Reilly on YouTube. Let's get back into it. Well, what did your parents yeah. say when you decided you were going to be an actor when you told them? No, that's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what they said. My mother was like, listen, listen, listen. Before you quit, just send me one more check, and then you can quit. And I was like, mom. But uh, they they were supportive after they got over the fact that I was going to do it. You know, They're like, you can't just jump in and jump out. And I was like, I know, mom. I know. Okay. Uh, but they got over it, and they've been pretty supportive since, you know. Well, that's good. So I think you said yeah. that it was a little slow going from maybe the first 12 years. <laughs> yeah. Don't, hey, Steve, don't say it like that, baby. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> James, um, you said it was slow for like three quarters of your life. Then what happened? Like, oh my God, yeah. <laughs> so how were you how were you paying the bills during the slow period? Oh, man, I did every... Well, I'm, my primary job at the time when I was coming up was in restaurants. Of course, you know, av- every actor has a restaurant job once in a while. But yeah, primarily I worked in restaurants as a bartender, a, a waiter. Occasionally I would buy a bunch of cars from like the auto... My, I thought it was a used car salesman for a while there. So I'd buy cars, fix them up, and then sell them. It's just a matter, Steve, of what you think you can do. And I used to think that I could do a lot of stuff. So I just did it, you know, and then... That was the primary way I supported myself. Gotcha. I got a buddy who buys cars and uh, fixes them up, and he has his own little lot. It's out. It's out in um, Evanston, Wyoming, which is oh wow. About, uh, it's about two hours outside of Salt Lake City, and he okay. is actually a four-time Olympic Jamaican bobsledder. Oh wow! He has an amazing story. It's really cool. And he ended up in Salt Lake City. Yeah, in Evanston, Wyoming. So it's it's sort wow. of a long, convoluted story, but one of the lawyers in that small town of Evanston loved the movie Cool Runnings so much that he reached uh-huh. out to the team to see if he could help make Evanston, Wyoming their North American training headquarters. And so that's how it all happened. Oh, wow. That's funny. And then my buddy Winston, he liked it so much, he just stayed there. Wow. Good for him for living there. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a, a thing to do to, you know, be buying and selling cars and whatnot. Hell yeah. Yeah. Do you ever do that anymore? No, man. No, man. I just look at cars now, you know. Just like, yeah, <laughs> He's like, I'm too busy know? for that shit, Steve. <laughs> yeah, there's some things I just can't take on right now. It's just, you know, because you're just busy. And then, you know, I really love what I'm, I'm doing as an actor, you know, and, and plus I'm writing. So we've got a couple of, ca- like we've got a catalog of things that uh, we're getting produced and stuff like that. So, you know, I enjoy what I do, the, the life that I carved out in the entertainment world. So 
There's not too many other things that, you know, turn me on enough to go that way. Right. So I want to talk about some of the uh, older things that you were a part of before we start talking about some of the newer stuff. Okay. First, I want you to tell me how uh, how Shawshank Redemption changed your life. Well, it, you know, now this was the stage adapted play version of it. The only uh, uh, authorized one, right? Right. The only authorized version that Castle Rock allowed, which we did in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, it was just one of those things. And I, 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 I was drinking coffee at a coffee shop. I think I had quit my job in corporate America. And I was drinking coffee at a coffee shop and saw this poster. And it said, come audition for Shawshank Redemption stage play. And I said, oh, I'm going to go do this. Again, it comes with attitude that I think I can do a lot of things. So uh, I go and audition. I get the part of Bob. So everybody, all the, the characters you think would be the, the characters that were in the movie were all reversed. So Boggs was a white cat, and they, and they cast me as Boggs. And then uh, Red was a white cat, and the other, it was reversed. Everything was reversed, which is kind of cool, you know what I mean? Uh, but this woman at the time had uh, saw me in the play, and she said, hey, you're really good. You know, do you have an agent? I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I have an agent. And then... She took me on and she got me some voiceover stuff. And then I moved to another agency and that's where I booked the Best Buy commercial. And then I I felt from there, I was like, oh, maybe this is is a good gig, you know, like to be an actor. And then I got the the bug to go to San Francisco and and left. What kind of voiceover stuff did you do? Mainly commercials. I I do a lot of uh, voiceover now too. I I did voiceover for the, uh, I did ADR, which is sort of a voiceover things they use in films and they can't get the main actors. I did ADR for uh, uh, Nick Fury's voice in uh, the, the Spider-Man movie that just came out. I did uh, uh, this Triple G fight promo. I also, also did the Heisman promo. And I did the voice of Robert Guillaume in a, in a new video game, an old video game that's coming up. I imitated his voice. So yeah, so it was basically commercials and you know, sort of ADR work and then some games. This is going to sound like a super stupid question, but what kind of a video game has Robert Guillaume in it? Like, what? Oh, that's not a stupid question, Steve. It's a real stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even <laughs> uh, No, um, uh, it's, a, it's called Jamiroquai. That's the code name for it. But it was a, I guess it was a game that came out about 10 years ago maybe 10 years ago, and then it was really popular, and then they dropped it off. And But he had done the voice of this character on, on this uh, uh, video game. And uh, he died, I guess, kind of like about six years ago. But I knew Robert Guillon, and he was kind of the... I used to work at a restaurant called uh, Delmonico's, and he, he was actually the voice of reason for comedy for me. Uh, this is after he had his stroke. We were talking, and he said, James, if you're going to do comedy, don't be a buffoon. You know, we've got enough buffoons out there. If you're going to do comedy, do smart comedy. You know, make it thought-provoking. Make it good. Just don't get out there and, and do slapstickish dumb stuff. And that, and that kind of, like, took me out of the comedy realm for a minute because a lot of my friends who uh, were doing comedy got stuck in comedy. Uh, you know, there's only a few cats, like, that, that I remember doing comedy with that are they're doing a lot of different things now, like, DL's doing a lot of different things. Cedric obviously is doing a, a lot of different things. And, you know, if you look at Steve Harvey, I mean, those are the first three dudes who did Def Jam comedy uh, in the, in the, where I opened up for them, uh, along with Bernie Mac, who got a chance to do a diverse amount of things. But there's other cats who are just stuck in that slapstickish buffoonery world. And I don't, I, I don't want to be a part of that. That's not my entertainment value. You know what I mean? I can be funny. But that's not what I want to do is buffoonery stuff. Gotcha. Uh, now, for the younger listeners who might not be all that familiar with Robert Guillaume, he was the voice of Rafiki in The Lion King, the first one mm-hmm. from the 90s mm-hmm. or whatever. So yep. that's probably where all of you youngsters know him best from. Yeah, we know him from Soap and Benson and all that other stuff he did, you know. Yeah, we do. Soap and yeah. Benson. That was amazing. Soap and Benson, yeah. One of the shows you were on is, in my opinion, one of the best and most underrated shows of all time. 
Can you tell me about your experience on the television show Southland? Yeah, Southland was, uh, I believe Southland was a TNT show. Correct. Uh, Kevin was on the show. I think Regina was on the show. Regina King, I think she was on Correct. the show. Correct, she was. It was one of the first gritty, like, sort of crime police series. You know, the, the other one was on FX, and I think uh, Chicklis, Michael Chicklis was on that. I forgot the name the of that Shield? show, but that was The Shield. So this came along when The Shield was, was on, and it's like a gritty cop show, you know what I mean? Like a true-to-life cop show. Um, almost like uh, like, like I, I thought the shield was a was a good was a really good show. It showed that sort of side of of being a cop and what can happen being a cop and the things that can happen. So kind of foretold, you know, my future about being a cop. You know, I think I played the majority of cops in general. Yeah, you yeah. played a lot of cops and a lot of men of the cloth. Yeah, yeah. Well, a couple a couple men of the cloth. Generals and cops seem to be my thing. You know. <laughs> That's a great stereotype to have, right? Yeah, man. Keeps you working. Yeah, it does. And plus, it's better than being known as the junkie. Uh, you know, oh, he's that guy who always plays a junkie or whatever. Right. You know, like uh, things could have gone a lot. I, mean, I guess maybe Bubbles from The Wire could have got typecast. I mean, luckily he didn't. Yeah. He played the the mayor in a show called Hand of God. Okay. Uh, it was a great show. Great, great show. Yeah, Bubbles ended up on a couple of great series, you know? Bubbles is amazing. Every time I see that dude, I'm just like, oh, I love that dude. That dude's amazing. Bubbles. Yeah. Uh, who is your favorite person between these two people? Corey Dawkins or Michael B. Jordan? Uh, my favorite person between Corey Hawkins and Michael B. Jordan. I did a show with Michael B. Jordan called The Cold Case. I think I would play his father. But at that time, he wasn't Michael B. Jordan. He was more like Michael B. Scotty Pippen. You know what I mean? He wasn't, you know, he, <laughs> you know, he, wasn't, he wasn't what he is now. You know, he was, you know, second team, all, all, you know, NBA. Corey had just finished uh, straight out of Compton. So, you know, I met these two guys. Mike had a little bit more of a serious shot rise. Well, Corey is still, you know, doing things coming up. But favorite person? I don't know, man. They, if you put them together, I'd probably say them both. They were both kind dudes, you know, young cats. They, they, they were both just cool. Just just both cool. That's kind of what I was hoping you would say. Yeah, yeah. It, do you have any stories uh, from being on the set with either one of those two? Uh, I had a story about Michael B. Jordan, which is pretty funny. And so I said, so we're shooting Cold Case, and I go, and then Mike was relatively new. That's why I call him Michael B. Scotty Pippen. He might have been like Michael B. Stacy King. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I said to him, hey, man, listen, you know, if you ever need anything, you know, out here in L.A., whatever, whatever, take my number. You know, just let's keep in touch, stay in touch. You know, I, you know, I'll try to do what I do for you and whatever, whatever. So, oh, yeah, cool. Black cool. All right, cool. Three weeks later, this dude ends up on Friday Night Lights. And I call him and I say, hey, man, remember, remember that offer I made to you, bro? Uh, can we reverse that? <laughs> that needs some help, too, right now. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, he had that meteoric rise and meteoric rise. And, and, and you know, he was off in the, you know, hyperspace. But it was funny. It was like, I, I you know, I, I hit him up and I was like, dude, you know. He was like, yeah, man. I was like, okay, success, man. Keep it going. And, you know, after that, it's just one thing after another. Yeah, I didn't watch uh, Friday Night Lights because I live in Texas, and so that uh -huh. does not appeal to me. You know, like, okay. been there, done that, lived it, that whole thing. But right. the first time I saw him on Parenthood, I was like, holy uh -huh. shit, that's that dude from The Wire. <laughs> yeah. The Wire. All right, now, now remember, you don't have to answer this. Oh, okay. Who's a bigger piece of shit, Adrian Grenier or Jeremy Piven? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know the answer to that. I think you know the answer to that. It is called both. <laughs> Neither one of those fools have a good reputation. No, man. You can put them in the, in the same room and tell them, both, tell them both to leave in the order what they think <laughs> yeah. they should go out in, and they would both get stuck in the door hinge. You know what I mean? They would just, because they're just... 
<laughs> well, I'm going to probably go out on a limb and say Adrian Grenier is probably a bigger piece of shit because uh, have we even heard from him at all since that show was off the air? Well, he, listen, he made enough money where he started producing his own like stuff. But I told him one day, man, he was like we, we we did an episode, or I did an episode of Entourage. And he was just, it was, it was not, and it was not nice. And I told him, you know, I was like, I was like, dude, it, I don't in my mind. I didn't tell him, but in my mind, I was like, dude, this is your last hurrah, bro. You gotta be nice. And and it came true. I think he did one other movie with where he played the boyfriend of the of uh, uh, the girl in uh, Devil Wears Prada. And then after that, I was like, oh. You just hope it doesn't happen to you. You know, there are things you can't control, and being a dickhead at work is one of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So enough about that. those cool people. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. Hey, guys, if you like what I'm doing, click the Amazon banner at the top of the homepage on FascinationStreetPod.com and do all of your shopping through Amazon. Once you click on it and it takes you to Amazon, you can bookmark it or add it to your favorites and you won't have to go to my site each time. It helps me keep the show going. And again, thanks for listening. Let's get back into it. One of the biggest shows currently on television is This Is Us. Uh huh. And I believe it was last season there was a plot line where Randall, one of the main characters, was trying to decide whether or not he was going to run for city council. Right. And he went to talk to a, a local pastor in that district or a preacher or minister or whatever he was. And uh-huh. um, that's you. Right. Rev Harley. There you go. Rev Harley. Now, is that show filmed in Pittsburgh? No, it's actually filmed, and, and, and in, in Philadelphia is where they think they, they set it, but it's actually filmed in, in, uh, in Los Angeles, in and around. They, they'll do out shots, you know, they'll do exterior shots uh, of Philadelphia or wherever, Jersey, and put them in. But no, that, that's actually shot in L.A. Well, that's got to be awesome. You don't have to get on a plane, man. No, man, no. You can just drive to the lot and go. Hopefully they uh, hopefully they see the importance of me and they bring me back. Well, I feel like at least in in that episode, I feel like uh, you were sort of a Yoda for him. So it'd be great yeah. if you could continue that. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Did he win the election, by the way? Yeah, he won. Okay, great. I'm coming back. And then he moved his whole family because you know they were living in Jersey or New York Jersey. or something, wherever, yeah. wherever they were living. Yeah, so he moved the whole family to uh, to Philadelphia. Okay. Okay. All right. So, I'm feeling, yeah, I'm, maybe I'm you feeling the vibes, back. bro. Maybe I can come back. You know, <laughs> feeling the vibes, right. bro. Very cool. Now, there's a, a a film. I believe it. It's either about to come out or it's already out, and uh-huh. it is called. It's called Black and Blue. Yeah, it, it came out October 25th. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had the premiere in New York a couple of weeks ago, and then we had a, a special screening event in Los Angeles right before that. Twelve million dollar movie, part of so- Sony Screen Gems, that subsidiary that does you know these movies that have this lower budget, but they seem to make all their money back. It was sort of like what Lionsgate did with uh, Tyler Perry's movies. You know, Tyler would make a movie that was you know ten, fifteen, and it would gross sixty or seventy million. So that that's the same sort of uh, strategy that they came up with for Sony Screen Gems. That it's always been one of those things that they do the lower budget movies, and then Sony itself, international, do the uh, higher budgeted films. But yeah, it's out in theaters right now. They actually made their money back already, so that was I was happy about that. Oh, that's kick ass. Yeah, yeah, they made their money back already with two thousand only two thousand theaters. They only opened in two thousand theaters, so wow, that's I, I thought great. That was pretty good. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Fantastic. Now, also in this film is uh, Tyrese Gibson, uh, Naomi Harris, and Mm -hmm. I think Mike Coulter's in there, right? Mike Coulter, Frank Grillo, uh, the guy from uh, Veep, uh, Reed Scott, and um, uh, Bo Knapp is in it also. And then, of course, Naomi Harris is in it. Uh, So, yeah, we had some some players in it. Now, that is a – I watched the trailer. That's a pretty big action cop. Uh, you know, good guy, bad guy, kind of a dilemma. Like I, I love the the premise of that film. Like it, it seems uh-huh. like a really great story. Uh, I'm super excited to see it. Yeah, 
from what I could tell, you have a pretty big role in, in that film. Where did that shoot? That shot in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, we shot it all in that city. Of course, it was about, it, it wasn't, it was based on a Peter Dowling uh, writing it and penned it. And it was his story, and then Sony bought it. Uh, but yeah, it took place in New Orleans. It was about a six week shoot. Um, I think I was there for practically all six weeks. Uh, but I had been in New Orleans before I'd stayed in New Orleans. I went down there for some work and ended up staying for like four years or five years and then came back to L.A. So it's, it's a gritty cop drama. There's, there's tons of action. I mean, it, it goes it goes from the beginning to the end. It's just constant action, uh, thrills and, 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 you know, things that you would expect from a fast moving cop movie. Kick ass. The trailer makes it look sort of like that movie Training Day. Trading Day, yeah. That's a lot of the comparisons were made about that. You know, people thought, oh, this is a modern day training day. And I and I and I also made that same claim as well. There was a lot of scenes that were shot that looked like parts of training day and it it was that. It was it was probably a modern day training day where Ethan Hawke is now a woman and then you had five Denzel Washingtons, me being the best looking of them all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we won't tell Tyrese's fan club you said that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, or Cotler. Well, Cotler wasn't a cop, but yeah, yeah. So it was pretty good, man. I had I had fun doing it. Oh, very cool. Now I don't know what you can tell me, but uh, tell me what you can about the upcoming uh, Operation Eight 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 Eight. Well, uh, Steve, I can tell you it's called Operation Eighty Eight Eighty Eight. How's that? Sweet. Well, <laughs> are you also allowed to say that it's going to be on Amazon? Yeah, we could say Amazon. We could definitely say Amazon. We shot it. We shot it in uh, Durango, Durango and Mexico City. So we shot it. The first part of it was shot uh, in Durango, which is Durango's famous for scorpions and mezcal. Um, you probably want to do the mezcal first before you do the scorpions. <laughs> yeah, you know, you don't want to mess with scorpions. I, I've never been a scorpion person. You know, I didn't see any while I was there. Believe it or not. I did see fire ants, and I wanted to have an experience with fire ants, and then my best judgment said, nah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then Mexico City. Mexico City was an adventure in itself, man. I had never been to Mexico City in my life. Uh, the thing I learned about Mexico City was that they don't have any emission controls. The air quality was super poor. It didn't stop me from drinking mezcal. You know, I think that was the drink of choice while I was down there because – you know, you can't drink unfiltered water or anything. What's this? Now, this is the thing that got me, Steve. You can't drink the water, right? The, the tap water, whatever, whatever. But you can swim in a pool. It doesn't, that really don't make sense to me, you know? And I see them pour tons of chlorine into the pool, but I'm like, eh, it doesn't make sense to me. I think I'm going to go swimming anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a good shoot. It was six, no, three week, four week shoot, uh, from July 31st to August 28th. Awesome. Yeah. Now, again, since this is all top secret still, I know that a second season was green lit. Uh, uh did you die in the first season? No, man. No, I, you know, I, I, I told them, I said, listen, man, let me at least get three seasons in before you kill me. That way I can pay off. All, all of my Sears and Robux credit card bill. Uh, so Sears and Robux. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, I think we're going to get three seasons out of the deal. Now, I can't tell you what's going to happen after season three um, in terms of my longevity on the show, but I think they, they got all three seasons. And we only do eight episodes per season, so not like uh, – um, this is us where they do, I think, 23 or 24 episodes in a season. Yeah, um, they do a bunch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, listen, I wouldn't mind that payday that they're having, you know. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, $250,000 per episode for 24 episodes. I'm like, she's a man. Who's getting that? Uh, they all signed a, a deal, which they all, they got, they got their pay increase the end of the first season. Uh, into the second, they got a pay increase across the board. Everybody got two fifty per episode. Oh, fav- favored nations or whatever. That's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. So that was cool. I was like, good for them, man. Good for them. Yeah, good for them. 
Yeah. And that show is making everybody billions of dollars. So oh, my goodness. No harm, man. no foul. No harm, no foul, man. But that's the extent for our show. It's just eight episodes. That's what we do. I mean, it's fun. I work with a guy who was on Black Sales, uh, Toby Schmidt. Really fun dude. And then the rest of them, uh, the rest, they do it in subtitles and English. So the rest of the, the people on the show are relatively newbies to me. Um, some experience. And then the rest of them were from like, uh, Mexican TV. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. I saw this movie the other day. It was, it took place in Las Vegas, like back in the fifties. And it was about mm-hmm. this hotel. I think it was called Moulin Rouge. This uh-huh. casino. Yep. And I'm totally kidding. But yeah, I, I know you were. I was just excited to see this movie. I was just like, see how movie. far that joke would go, go, Steve. You know what I mean? No. <laughs> so tell tell me about that film, and I, I believe it is, a, or it might even be a television show. I'm not sure, but it's a script that you wrote, right? Right, right. It's a script called I call it Fifty Five. It's actually about the uh, first integrated hotel and casino that opens in a in America in the 1950s, specifically it's Fifty Five in the town of Las Vegas during the Jim Crow era. Which, if any of your listeners don't know, uh, Jim Crow was a major racial sort of law that went into effect to, um, in, in effect, discriminate against blacks uh, uh, in, in any part of Jim Crow country. And so this ho- hotel opened up in 55, and it was an inclusionary hotel. It was the first integrated hotel and casino in America. And there was, this, there was a guy, uh, fictional. Now, this guy is fictional, Phil, the guy that I made up. Uh, and he was uh, a white guy, a real prominent scout for one of the hotels. He had some health issues, and he goes and gets checked, and he discovers that he has the sickle cell trait. And from that, his world gets turned upside down because if you had any trace of uh, heredity that it, that was black, uh, no matter what the amount was, you were black. You could no longer you know, be that entitled white person uh, that you thought you were in the fifties. And, uh, and it turns, the the story turns up uh, from that point. Like he said, for everybody who is unfamiliar back then, black people weren't even allowed to swim in the same pools as white people. They weren't allowed to stay in the same hotels. I believe that, um, when the Rat Pack came to town, it was Frank Sinatra that demanded that Sammy gets to stay in the hotel with us or we're not playing here. Right. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of a lot of times there where you know you could have a name on the marquee, you know maybe Pearl Bailey, maybe Dorothy Dandridge, and these these performers, these black performers, couldn't even stay, and and secondly, they couldn't even come through the front door uh, of of these uh, of these establishments like Frontier Hotel, Stardust, whatever it was. Uh, and so yeah, uh, Frank said one day, you know, listen, man, this is my buddy. Uh, if he doesn't perform here, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I mean, if he doesn't get to stay here, I'm not going to, I'm not going to play here. And, and, and again, he was allowed to stay, but he couldn't, he couldn't roam through the hotel. You know what I mean? He didn't have right. freedom. He didn't yeah. have access to the complete hotel. So, I mean, Frank Sinatra did a lot of things for uh, African-Americans, blacks, uh, Negroes in that day. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that Hugh Hefner did a lot to, for social change, too, even though his, his company was named Playboy. He did a lot for social change, you know, in terms of um, civil rights and, and civility toward uh, everybody, I mean, women, blacks, whatever. Well, I think that um, part of the reason that those people are icons and will be remembered for time and memoriam that has a lot to do with it. It wasn't just that they were successful or charismatic or whatever, but also they used their, their platform to affect change. Right. So that's pretty dope. Everybody who's listening, if you've ever seen that, you know, there's that always that famous picture of the, uh, the rat pack in front of the sands hotel. And it has all of their names on the marquee behind them. Everybody's name is in black except Sammy Davis jr. Because he was black. So, it was in everything. I mean, yeah, he could have his name on the marquee, but not in the same color as the rest of the folks. So right. it's, I can't imagine how great that movie is going to be. How is that movie coming? Um, it's a, it's in an option phase right now. So I've got someone optioning it right now. Uh, but we, we want to move with um, pre-production by like February or March. 
So we, I've got a, I've got some ties. I've got some people interested in playing some some parts. It's Sterling K. Brown that's going to hopefully come on board. Um, I, I was talking to him about playing one of the parts. Tyrese is going to hopefully do a a, a short pop up as Nat King Cole. Uh, you know, so there's there's some people attached. I don't want to give you all the names away because you know I'm not quite sure if they're going to come on board. But there's going to be some in- sure. interesting uh, interesting cameos. Definitely some interesting cameos nice. will happen in it. Yeah. Well, while you're at it, see if you can't get Ron Cephas Jones to do something. Ron Cephas Jones. I mean, who is that? No, remind me of who that is. Uh, on the on this is us. He plays uh, Sterling's birth father. Oh, okay. 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 He played. I think he was a jazz musician on the show. So I'm bet I'm betting that he has some jazz skills, and he's a great actor. So it sounds like he would fit perfectly. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at him right now. Yeah. He. Oh yeah. He probably. I know that dude. Yeah. Yeah. He. He would. He would almost almost uh, be a uh, yeah character. He looks like a character from the fifties. You know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. He does. He does. All right, Ron, you're going to owe me a royalty on this one. Yeah, What's Ron, you owe him some money, baby. You owe him some money. <laughs> <laughs> if I am correct, do you have another project that you're writing, another film you're working on that uh, maybe you wrote? Yeah, we got a couple, man. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm now these I can't really talk about because they're not even they haven't. But we, we're doing some. We're doing some. You know, you remember Newsday and you remember shows like. Uh, West Wing, and so we're we're developing a show based on the current uh, climate, the world climate uh, through the lenses of America. So it's uh, it, 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 yeah, man, yeah, yeah. And then I got another one. That's that I, not going to be a comedy. <laughs> no, that is not going to be a comedy. Man. That is not, you know what I mean? maybe the outshoots, the outtakes will be comedy, but no, but this ain't going to be a comedy, man. So uh, that one we're working on, and then uh, we we've got another one. Uh, in the in the works right now that I have uh, I'm out to a couple people, which I think can be really good. It's it's a, a really it's a lower budget movie, but it's going to be great because it's just it's just you know it's just one of those it's a modern day misery. That's what I can tell you, Steve. It's a modern day misery. Just you remember mi- Misery with uh, Kathy Bates and uh, James Caan. Yeah, I really hope that in this version they get that guy who still hasn't finished writing the Game of Thrones, and then all the nerds beat the shit out of him. <laughs> uh, this is a this is a twist. <laughs> this is a, this is a good twist to this one, man. This is a good twist. Put it this way, it's a good twist. Yeah, there's a good twist to this one. Man. Nice. But yeah, that's it. That, I'm starting to venture more into you know the writing world and and the, and the finance world as well. You know, trying to get my films independently financed so I don't have to like chase studios down to do it. But you know, you got to do what you got to do for the first couple. That's the truth. Yeah. So I know that we've been talking for a while and I am going to, going to ask you for your, um, your social media tags. But first I want to ask you if there's anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you about that you wanted to talk about. No, I think you you covered it, man. You, you did, you did your, uh, your your thing, yeah. No, I think everything that we covered was was cool, and I, I don't I don't feel that there was anything excluded. Kick ass! That was my goal. Now tell everybody where they can find you on social media. Well, if you're forty and under, the gram. If you're forty <laughs> and over, Facebook. <laughs> you know, most people over forty know. I don't even know if they know what Instagram is, unless they're famous or something, but. Uh, if you're if you're uh, 40 and under, or you just are capable, um, on Instagram is my my uh, my my search line or whatever it is, is who is James Moses Black? All of that. And then on Facebook, who? Yep, who is James Moses Black? Okay. Because typically when they see me in a movie, like who is that guy? You know. Gotcha. Like, you know, so, so I just I just put my name to the rest of it. And then on Facebook, you know. 40 and over, 50 plus, 60 if you're still going, 70, good. Uh, it is just <laughs> James Moses Black. <laughs> and are you on uh, Twitter at all? No, I haven't tweet. I, I don't I don't tweet as much. I'm, I'm having a hard time with the gram, you know. So tweeting is like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I did, I did. <laughs> you know, there's some things after you reach a certain age, you just go, yeah, well, that, that's not going to be me, man. I'm, I'm cool. 
but I did recently hire my uh, my nephew Cole Green. Uh, Cole Green, he's an up and coming musician. He does a lot of stuff, man. He's just he's just really phenomenal. Uh, but he, I hired him as my uh, media account person, and uh, he's working on music with a couple little studios around LA. So hopefully he he gets it done. But yeah, he's doing all my social media stuff right now. Oh, awesome! Cole Green, yeah, Cole Green, Cole Green. Uh, I'm looking at the wrong Cole Green, I guess, because this guy is a uh, yeah, thirty year old baseball player. No, 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 no. Yeah, you're looking at the wrong Cole Green. Uh, uh, his Twitter handle is at Cole Green. I believe that's what it says. Is there an E at the end of Green? Yeah, and it's K O L E Green, G R E E N E, at Cole Green underscore, and then Instagram at Cole Green underscore. Gotcha. Cool, cool. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he has some music some on there song. too. If you get a chance, check it out. Yeah, 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 I was about to say that. Yeah, cool. All right, rock on. Well, uh, James Moses Black, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to hang out and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for giving me a call, man. Let me be a part of it. I had a wonderful time, and uh, I cannot wait to go see Black and Blue. So, thank you in advance for the fine work you did on that film, sir. Thanks, man, and enjoy the movie. I think you'll like it. And all of you who are listening out there, please go see Black and Blue, elements of what we all should understand. Plus, it's an action-packed movie. Um, it's in your theater near you. Just look up the local listings and uh, go check it out. Hit me up on Instagram if you go see it. Nice. Give me an opinion. Thank you so much, Mr. Black. You have a great rest of your week. Thanks, Steve. Bye. You too, man. All right, bye-bye. As always, thanks for listening, Streetwalkers. And don't forget, follow the show on Twitter at FascinationSTPD. On Instagram at FascinationStreetPod. Follow the podcast page on Facebook at FascinationStreetPodcast. And of course, you can always email me at FascinationStreetPod at gmail.com. And if you haven't already, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button and rate us on iTunes. For the next three months, everybody who rates and reviews the show and sends a screenshot to fascinationstreetpod at gmail.com will get a free surprise gift mailed to them. Every single one of you. So do it. Thanks, Streetwalkers. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2014 album Intransigence. Used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is Apollo from the 2001 album Into the Known by the band Sapphire. Thanks for hanging out with us and getting to know a little bit about our guest. We'll see you next time on Fascination Street.